Hello, everyone. Today we'll be talking about Beckwith Weedman and Russell Silver syndromes. Today is part two of a series on imprinting disorders. And today's talk is going to be given by Sophia Dayarda. She's a genetic counseling student at UCSF. So, Sophia, go ahead. Thanks, Daniel. So just like with the first imprinting lecture, we will be presenting two conditions in this lecture. Uh, like Daniel said, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and Russell-Silver syndrome. We're presenting these two conditions because different changes at the same imprinted region, which is 11P15, can result in either Beckwith-Wiedemann or Russell-Silver. On the right in this slide is a simplified schematic of this region, and we will take a closer look at this region in just a few slides. Here's a snapshot of the prevalence of these two conditions. They are both rare diseases. One important note here is that the literature suggests that the incidence of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome increases with the use of assisted reproductive technologies, such as IVF. Specifically, it is believed that the use of assisted reproductive technologies increases the incidence of Beckwith-Wiedemann that is due to methylation differences. We will discuss later what these methylation di differences look like. So going into the clinical features of these two conditions, we can characterize these two conditions as sort of opposites. Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome has many overgrowth features, while Russell-Silver syndrome has many undergrowth features. And we'll see in a couple of slides why the molecular reason for this makes sense. But starting with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, here are some of the hallmark features. Because Beckwith-Wiedemann is an overgrowth condition, individuals present with macrosomia or hemihyperplasia, which is lateralized overgrowth. If hemihyperplasia involves a large leg length discrepancy, a referral to orthopedics may be useful for those individuals. Most individuals have macroglossia or a large tongue. If this interferes with feeding or breeding, breathing, it may require surgical intervention. Kidney anomalies are present in about half of individuals, while cardiac anomalies are present in about 13% of individuals. These may require in referrals to nephrology or cardiology for appropriate evaluations. In line with this overgrowth nature of the condition, individuals with Beckwith-Wiedemann are at increased risk for rare pediatric tumors, such as Wilms tumor or hepatoblastoma. Referrals to pediatric oncology are recommended for surveillance and monitoring of these. About half of individuals have neonatal hypoglycemia and should be referred to endocrinology for surveillance. Quality of life is not expected to be too heavily impacted in adulthood for these individuals. Now, switching over to Russell Silver syndrome, which is characterized by many undergrowth features, these growth abnormalities include being small for gestational age, postnatal growth failure, or growth hormone deficiencies, which can all be evaluated by endocrinology. Most individuals have dysmorphic features such as relative microcephaly at birth or frontal bossing. Most infants with Russell Silver have feeding difficulties, which can warrant referrals to gastroenterology or nutritionists. Most individuals have skeletal features, and very commonly this includes fifth finger clinodactyly. Some features such as scoliosis or hemihypoplasia may warrant special evaluations. Most individuals with Russell Silver syndrome have craniofacial anomalies, such as cleft palate, that may require intervention. And many individuals have developmental delays, which can include global developmental delays or speech delays, and can warrant educational support. And just a note for both of these conditions, this slide does not list the complete set of clinical features, so other findings may be relevant as well. And for both of these conditions, there are clinical diagnostic criteria using the presence of all or some of these features, and we will discuss the specific clinical diagnostic criteria later on in the presentation. Now we're going to dive into the molecular genetics of these two conditions. So it's helpful to start with a global view of the methylation and gene expression pattern of our region of interest, which is again 11P15, or we can refer to it as the Beckwith-Wiedemann critical region. This region involves two imprinting control centers, IC1 and IC2. In unaffected individuals, the paternal allele is methylated at IC1, which allows for expression of certain genes, importantly, the IGF2 gene, which is a growth factor gene. 
On the other hand, the maternal allele is methylated at IC2, which allows for expression of other genes, including CDKN1C, which acts as a tumor suppressor and fetal growth regulator. So in other words, we have gene expression from the paternal allele, which promotes growth thanks to IGF2, and gene expression from the maternal allele, which suppresses growth, thanks in part to CDKN1C. And we need a balance of gene expression from both of these alleles in order to achieve a healthy amount of growth. In general, we can consider that loss of maternal gene expression can result in Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, and loss of paternal gene expression may result in Russell-Silver syndrome. This makes sense if we remember that the maternal allele suppresses growth, so loss of this function results in an overgrowth condition. Similarly, the paternal allele promotes growth, so loss of this function results in an undergrowth condition. We will look more closely at some examples in the following slides. Here we have one example of a genetic change that involves loss of methylation at IC1 on the paternal allele. Based off of what we just reviewed, a change affecting the paternal gene expression should result in Russell-Silver syndrome. Again, loss of methylation at IC1 will lead to loss of expression of IGF2 from that paternal allele. This will result in Russell-Silver syndrome, and this is actually the most common genetic etiology of Russell-Silver syndrome. Here is a different genetic change involving loss of um, IC2 methylation on the maternal allele, and this would result in Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Loss of IC2 methylation on the maternal allele leads to loss of gene expression, including CDKN1C tumor suppressor, and will result in Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. This is the most common genetic etiology of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. So we just introduced the most common genetic etiology for each of these two conditions, but here are some other common etiologies for both Beckwith-Wiedemann and Russell-Silver. You can see that UPD or uniparental disomy accounts for the second most common cause of both conditions. You may be wondering why for Russell-Silver um, syndrome, we list maternal UPD of chromosome seven, even though the Beckwith critical region that we've been discussing is in chromosome 11. There's less literature on the link between chromosome seven and Russell-Silver syndrome, but studies show that there is a second imprinted region on chromosome seven, which involves paternally expressed genes that are important for growth. So therefore, maternal UPD of chromosome seven would also result um, in loss of that gene expression and also result in Russell-Silver syndrome. Now we're moving on to discussing how a diagnosis of these two conditions may be established. For Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, the clinical findings are organized into tier one findings, including features like macroglossia and hemihyperplasia, and tier two findings, including features like kidney anomalies. The finding of two tier one features can establish the diagnosis. Alternatively, the presence of one tier one finding and one tier two finding can establish the diagnosis. And finally, the presence of at least one tier one or one tier two finding in addition to a molecular finding can establish a diagnosis. And the molecular findings include things like abnormal methylation in the Beth Beckwith-Wiedemann region, pathogenic variants in CDKN1C, and copy number variants in that region. One note here is that in some individuals, a molecular finding is detected in the absence of clinical features. In these cases, a diagnosis of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome is not established, but the increased tumor risks are still present. For Russell-Silver syndrome, there are clinical diagnostic criteria. The proband must have relative microcephaly at birth and frontal bossing in addition to two other clinical features from the list on this slide. A diagnosis can also be made independently by molecular testing. Findings like abnormal methylation, maternal UPD7, or pathogenic IGFR variants on the paternal allele can establish a diagnosis of Russell-Silver syndrome. The molecular testing strategies for both conditions starts with DNA methylation studies. Like we discussed a few slides ago, methylation defects are the most common causes of both Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and Russell-Silver syndrome. For Russell-Silver syndrome, it is also recommended to send for UPD-7 testing initially as well. Other testing options for both 
include testing genes of interest, such as CDKN1C or IGF2 for pathogenic variants. And another common testing option is to send for SNP chromosomal microarray to detect larger deletions or duplications, but these are more rare causes of both conditions. One note here is for Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, the sample type matters. Somatic mosaicism is not uncommon in Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, and in fact, it's present in about 20% of individuals. In these cases, sending a blood sample for testing may return negative results. So instead, you might want to send a sample type closer to the affected tissue, such as a, a buccal swab for an infant with macroglossia. And here's a simplified visual representation of a molecular testing strategy for Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, starting with an individual who has at least one tier one or tier two clinical finding. The first test to order is that DNA methylation analysis of the two imprinting control regions. If that returns negative, a next step would be to order CDKN1C single gene sequencing. And if that returns negative again, you can still make a clinical diagnosis if the proband meets that clinical diagnostic criteria that we discussed a moment ago. Also, another reminder that if the clinical presentation is suspicious, but the testing from a blood sample returns all negative, it can be a good idea to send an alternative sample type for testing to detect somatic mosaicism like we just discussed. And here is a simplified visual representation of a molecular testing strategy for Russell Silver syndrome. It's very similar to what we just saw for Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. And uh, again, if molecular testing returns negative, you may still turn to clinical diagnostic criteria to establish a diagnosis of Russell Silver syndrome. One of the important counseling considerations is, of, of course, recurrence risk to siblings, but Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and Russell-Silver syndrome are usually due to de novo post-zygotic methylation defects, so the recurrence risk to siblings is usually less than 1%. In some rare cases, it has been reported that unaffected parents of probands had genetic changes that resulted in either Beckwith-Wiedemann or Russell-Silver in their child. The slide lists some of those genetic changes that have been reported that may be inherited from unaffected parents. In these cases, the recurrence risk to siblings is higher and depends on exactly the genetic etiology. But in the case of inherited single gene pathogenic variants, the recurrence risk is 50%. And this slide shows a figure of a theoretical pedigree where the affected individuals have both inherited a pathogenic single variant from an unaffected father. And to conclude this presentation, I'd just like to present some helpful resources for families affected by Beckwith-Wiedemann and Russell-Silver syndromes. These organizations are committed to providing resources to affected families, raising awareness of the conditions, and providing updates on ongoing research. And that concludes this lecture on Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and Russell-Silver syndrome. If you found this lecture helpful or if you have any other feedback, please let Daniel know. Also make sure to catch up on the study rare newsletters that will be covering these conditions and other imprinting disorders and we'll be presenting you with some board style questions on these topics. Thank you so much Sophia for that enlightening presentation.